you know, it's a journey. <laughs> it's a journey. There's a lot of left turns. I know I've had a lot of left turns and different paths that I didn't expect in my leadership journey, but it's all been valuable. Um, I've taken risks and, you know, and I've had failures and I've had success and I learn probably more from my failures than I do my success, but it's all been helped form me as a leader. And, and I take all of that and I hold all of that as I go through this leadership journey. I hope you all do. And I hope I hope those of you who are leaders who are listening to this, I hope you lead with your authentic self and asking questions and you're collaborative and you're bringing people together. Hey, leader, and welcome to episode number 295 of the L3 Leadership Podcast, where we are obsessed with helping you grow to your maximum potential and to maximize the impact of your leadership. My name is Doug Smith, and I am your host, and today's episode is brought to you by my friends at Baritong Advisors. If you're new to the podcast, welcome. I'm so glad that you're here, and I hope that you'll enjoy our content and become a subscriber. And if you've been listening to us for a while, thank you so much, and it would mean the world to me if you would leave us a rating and review on whatever app you listen to this through. That really does help us grow our audience and reach more leaders, so thank you in advance for that. In today's episode, you'll hear my conversation with Lisa Scales. If you're unfamiliar with Lisa, let me tell you a little bit about her. Lisa's been the president and CEO of the Greater Pittsburgh Community Food Bank since 2012. She holds a JD degree from Boston University School of Law and Bachelor of Arts degree in Social Sciences from Seton Hill University. Lisa serves on the board of directors of Adego Health and is an advisory board member of the Center for Supply Chain Management at the University of Pittsburgh the Centers for Community Engagement at Robert Morris University and the University of Pittsburgh Johnstown Institute for Responsible Leadership. Lisa is a member of the University of Pittsburgh Institute of Politics Board of Fellows and an advisory team member of the Greater Pittsburgh Nonprofit Partnership. She currently serves as chair of Feeding Pennsylvania, and in 2018, Lisa received the Greater Pittsburgh Athena Award. And in January of 2021, Pittsburgh Magazine honored Lisa as Pittsburgher of the Year. In the interview, you'll hear Lisa share the lessons that she's learned in over 25 years of leading within the same organization. She actually started out as a volunteer in the organization and then got hired at an entry-level position and continually rose through the ranks of leadership. And at one point, she actually applied for the CEO position but did not get it. And you'll hear her talk about how, looking back, she wasn't ready even though she thought she was, and she shares the lessons learned there as well. So you're going to love this conversation. But before we get into that, just a few announcements. This episode of the L3 Leadership Podcast is sponsored by Baritung Advisors. The financial advisors at Baritung Advisors help educate and empower clients to make informed financial decisions. You can find out how Baritung Advisors can help you develop a customized financial plan for your financial future by visiting their website at baritungadvisors.com. That's B-E-R-A-T-U-N-G advisors.com. Securities and investment products and services offered through LPL Financial, member FINRA and SIPC, Baritung Advisors, LPL Financial, and L3 Leadership are separate entities. I also want to thank our sponsor, Henny Jewelers. They're a jeweler owned by my friend and mentor, John Henny. And my wife, Laura, and I got our engagement and wedding rings through Henny Jewelers and had an amazing experience. But not only do they have great jewelry, they also invest in people. In fact, every couple that comes in engaged to their store, they give them a book to help them prepare for marriage. And we just love that. So if you're in need of a good jeweler, check out hennyjewelers.com. And with all of that being said, let's dive right into the conversation. Here's my interview with Lisa Scales. Well, hey, Lisa, thank you so much for being willing to do this interview. I've watched your leadership from afar for years, and so I'm honored to, to have an hour with you and to learn from you. And why don't we just start off with you just telling us a little bit about who you are and what you do? Well, I'm really thrilled to be on the show with you, Doug. Thank you so much for the invitation. I'm the president and CEO of Greater Pittsburgh Community Food Bank, and I've been with the food bank now for almost 25 years. Wow. Hard for me to imagine it's been that long. I still remember getting ready to come into work on my first day at the food bank and um, not being sure I was going to be a good fit with the organization and uh, just felt like, well, uh, I'm going to do the best that I I can. And if if they don't like what I do, no, I won't be there very long. So it's it's certainly worked out. This is my fifth position. Uh, I started with the food bank as a program supervisor working on our urban agriculture programs. But now as president and CEO, I, I spend a lot of my time external to the food bank meeting with our, our supporters, our volunteers, our donors, 
uh, fundraising for the food bank, but also leading the food bank in terms of our strategic visioning process. Yeah, and I certainly want to dive into everything leadership at the food bank, but I do think your story is very, very interesting. Nonprofit world was not on your radar is my understanding. And so can you just share a little bit about your story and how you actually got into nonprofit work? Because I think it's pretty fascinating. Well, you're right. I did not um, start in, in the nonprofit in my career. I After college, I decided to go to law school. And I was at Boston University School of Law. And when I graduated, I went to work in Chicago for the city of Chicago in their law department and ended up in municipal prosecutions <laughs> prosecuting taxi cab drivers or bars or restaurants that had liquor licenses, we could suspend or revoke those licenses if, if there were complaints against them. And I was very happy as a lawyer. It was an exciting time for me. I did move back to southwestern Pennsylvania to Westmoreland County. Uh, at the time, both my father and my grandfather were practicing attorneys at a small firm in Greensburg, and I joined them uh, for a few years. And I love that work, love working with, with, with my dad and my grandfather, but it really didn't, didn't fuel my passion. I, I, I wanted something that to me was more meaningful. And when I decided to make a change, it was at that time that I met the person who was the fundraiser for the food bank. And she spoke so passionately about the food bank and the mission of the food bank that it got me thinking about nonprofits because frankly, when I was in school, we did not have community service projects. The uh, uh, nonprofit world wasn't even on my radar. Wow. And so as I was transitioning uh, jobs and thinking about what I wanted to do uh, in the future, that really, that's, that stayed with me. And I, I thought about food as a basic human need. When I came back to Pittsburgh, I traveled. I wasn't sure what I was going to do with my future. Came back to Pittsburgh. And at that time, someone told me about a job at Just Harvest, uh, anti-hunger advocacy and education organization on the South side. Uh, they were in Homestead at the time. They uh, were looking for interviewers for a childhood hunger study. So that was a temporary position. It was a six month study, minimum wage. So at that <laughs> time, I think it was roughly $5 an hour. Wow. So that's how I started my nonprofit career. And the six month study took a year and a half. Then I stayed on another temporary position to do school breakfast outreach. Then I led a women's leadership project for Just Harvest. And then the fateful day when Barbara, the fundraiser at the food bank, called me up and said, I want to buy you lunch. And I like to say the rest is his history. Uh, I came to the food bank and it's been a, a wonderful journey ever since. Yeah. I, so I have to ask you, because I think a lot of people in their careers, you know, you were a lawyer. I'm sure I'm, I'm assuming you weren't making minimum wage as a lawyer, just an assumption. That's um, right. <laughs> so uh, I think a lot of people start off their career and they say, hey, I want to go out and make my money. And then hopefully one day when I'm in my 50s or 60s, I can get ready for retirement. And then hopefully I can go and make a difference. You've been there for 25 years, so I, I'm doubting that you regret the decision that you made. But I am curious, you know, would you have any advice for young leaders who are maybe thinking about their career or even leaders that are mid-career and they're not happy with their job, they're wishing they could give their life away, but they're afraid to make that jump because look at the money I'm making, look at the lifestyle I'm living. Was, was that hard for you? And, and what would your advice be to those leaders? Yeah, I, I get asked that all the time. I do frequently meet with people who are considering changing careers, moving from the for-profit world to the nonprofit world. And then I tell them about my journey and they shake their head and they said, I can't, can't afford to, to work for minimum wage. And it was quite a risk. I, I, I think I was young and, you know, I just, it was, the mission was so important to me. The work was so important. I honestly threw caution to the wind and, and obviously it was a huge risk that did then work out for me. I mean, I did have to make significant lifestyle changes and it was not easy, but, you know, it certainly has been rewarding. You know, I think I was young enough at the time that I was able to, to adapt. I'm not sure, you know, if it had been 20 years later in my career, I, I, I could have made that same change. I mean, it is a challenge. And so what I encourage people 
who ask for my advice and ask about changing careers is I encourage them to volunteer for a nonprofit, mm. you know, engage, get engaged with the nonprofit, either in board service, committee service, or, or through volunteering hands on in a hands-on way. And that way you can get to know the organization. You can see if you like, you know, the culture, the organization, you're known by the leaders of that organization. And if a job opportunity opens up, you might be well positioned then to then get that job. Yeah. I, w- I also want to talk about the, the lunch you had with, I don't know if it was the director of development or whoever at the time, because this is fascinating. I'm a director of development, obviously. I'm very passionate. Just talk to leaders about the power of influence. Was it her just sharing her passion? Did she literally say, like, have you ever thought about a career and try to recruit you? Uh, I'm just curious what, what happened in that conversation. Yes, she was so passionate about the mission of the food bank and what the leadership of the food bank, the vision. I mean, I actually advocated to work at the food bank about two years before I got the phone call to, to have lunch and, and meet with, with her about an open position there. And it was really about the leadership and the mm-hmm. vision uh, of where the food bank was going and the impact the food bank was having. And, and that, that's really what was so fundamentally important to me. Yeah. And, and just, you know, it should be obvious why food is important and food banks are important. But for those listening, you know, can you share a little bit about that passion of why are food banks and community food banks so important in Pittsburgh and really in food banks in every city in America? That's right. And we're a member of the Feeding America network of food banks. We're one of 200 food banks across the country. And uh, most of us have a multi-county service area. Greater Pittsburgh Community Food Bank serves 11 counties in southwestern Pennsylvania. Some food banks serve an entire state and some only serve one county. But most of us serve geography similar to what uh, the Pittsburgh Food Bank serves. And, And really, we're there when people have an immediate food need. Hunger is an issue that is not easily identif- identifiable. Mm. You know, we see people every day. We interact with people every day who are food insecure or hungry. We just don't know it. You can't tell necessarily when somebody is food insecure. And so what it looks like isn't what it may look like in a developing country. So here in America, there are parents who skip meals so their kids can eat. There are uh, people who may eat once every two or three days. Uh, parents may, may stretch meals. They may do things so that others in their family can eat. So you don't always always see the people who are, who are hungry and know that they're hungry. And many of the people we serve are people who are working. They're earning low wages. And that's the biggest difference from when I started at the food bank in the mid-90s to now, a greater percentage of the households we serve Um, have someone there who is working often two or three jobs. They're just not earning enough to consistently put food on the table. And so, you know, for all those seniors who end up uh, choosing between paying for their medicine and paying for food, all the parents who are skipping meals, um, all the kids who go to bed hungry, you know, that's a reality for so many of our neighbors. Mm -hmm. And the food bank is there to provide a supplemental uh, amount of food. Typically, these days we serve, we provide our pantry network that provides grocery items, provides uh, a four or five day supply of food. But food banks has also transformed over the years. So we're doing much more uh, in addition to providing food to people. Yeah. And if someone's listening to this and they would say, hey, I'd be interested in, in helping the food bank out or how can I get involved? What would you tell them? Yes, we, uh, you know, we love people to, to make monetary donations, but also volunteer. We have a hands-on mission and we're always uh, looking for volunteers. We're, we're in constant recruitment mode when it comes to volunteers, whether you're volunteering here at our warehouse in Duquesne uh, near Kennywood Amusement Park. Uh, we're especially this summer, we've put out a number of alerts uh, looking for people to help pack emergency food boxes. And then we also have a wonderful gleaning program where we go to area farms and we harvest excess crops. Um, and then we need volunteers at our drive up distributions 
or at different events uh, throughout the region. So volunteering is a great way to get engaged with the food bank. It's good if you're uh, with the corporation, it's a great team building activity. Uh, it's also good for, for young people as well. Uh, and we have a number of retired seniors. It keeps them active, keeps them young. Um, so it's great, great for seniors as well. Um, and then advocacy is so critically important. The child nutrition programs are up for reauthorization at the federal level. There's state funding that we advocate for to help support our food needs. And locally at the city and county level, county levels, um, there's opportunities to advocate as well. Yeah, thank you so much. And we'll include links to everything that you just mentioned in the show notes if people want to get involved specifically here in Pittsburgh. And if you're not in Pittsburgh, just I'm sure look up a food bank in your city and you'll be able to find one uh, as well. Doug, I'll just say to, to just also look at our website, which is pittsburghfoodbank.org. And you can also find a food bank uh, in your area by going to Feeding America's website and they have a food bank locator. So no matter oh, where wonderful. you are in the United States, you can find a Feeding America food bank. Excellent. So yeah, we'll include links to all of those in the show notes. Um, I, I want to go back to now your first day. So you've made this transition. You decided I'm done with being a lawyer. I'm done with corporate. And, and it's fascinating that you were drawn not only by the passion of the, the fundraiser, but also the leadership and the culture. And I've only worked for nonprofits or faith-based organizations, so I've not had the corporate experience. But from what I'm told from people who have made that leap, nonprofits don't exactly operate all the time the same as corporate. When you entered in, you know, did you see, was it what you expected? Did you have a totally different experience? Was there a huge leadership need? Did you set out to be CEO? I'm just curious, you know, what that first year was like. Yes, you know, there, there was such a learning curve because the food bank even back then, now we were a much smaller organization, um, but even back then, it, it was from going from Just Harvest that we had seven employees to the food bank that had 40 employees at the time. It was a, it was a big change. And um, just the, the extent of our operations, the food banks are great at logistics and, and we're able to provide lots of food. You know, we bring food in by the tractor trailer load from around the country, around the world get it out through a network that's now over 850 network partners uh, in Southwestern Pennsylvania. So it, there was a lot to learn and, and there were programs. The other lesson from, our, from my interview for the uh, position is I was hired to oversee our, our programs. And at the time that was a farming operation, uh, farm stand project, and a garden and gleaning program. So it was our urban agriculture programs. I actually said in the interview, does it matter that I know nothing about agriculture? <laughs> now, I would not recommend that for anybody. Um, uh, fortunately, it worked out for me, but I was told, no, you don't need to know about agriculture. We have the staff that are running those programs. You know people, you know programming. Uh, we're looking for somebody to lead the effort and scale those programs up. And that's what we believe you can do. Um, and that's certainly what happened. So I had to also learn about food bank. Not only did I have to learn about food banking, I also had to learn about each of those individual programs. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's what's so critical and, and what I'm so, what I love about the food, you know, we, uh, what I love about the food bank is we have such talented staff. We did back then too. And, and I really leaned heavily on our program staff that that knew the day-to-day -day and knew what they were doing. And it was just for me a matter of visioning with them, speaking with them, coaching them, but talking about how we could scale up these programs to have an even greater impact in the in the community. So leaving them to their day-to-day -day work and I was there to help nurture this and grow our, our program department. So my first year at the food bank was spent on scaling up the programs. We have talented program staff in place that were handling the day-to-day -day and running programs and doing an exceptionally good job at that. And, and my role really was working with them to have an even greater impact. And so when I reflect on my first year, I was not focused at all on, oh, someday I'm going to become the CEO. I was really in learning mode and, and learning the programs and working with the staff to uh, uh, determine how best 
to increase the work that we were doing, how to scale it up and have an even greater impact. And I'm often asked though, you know, why was I on this trajectory towards the CEO? And I think from early on, I was always thinking larger than my team or my department. I was always looking to see how we connected with other departments at the food bank, what the impact of our work was on, on other departments. And I was always interested in hearing what the successes were and the challenges that the other, my, the other managers were having. What, what, what were the struggles of the other departments? And, you know, it, you do have to, it's how you ask questions too, Doug, because, um, you know, people can get their feathers ruffled if you ask a lot of questions about their area of work. And I was always sensitive to that as well. And so it was really about me having a, a better understanding and wanting to really understand what um, another department was doing and to see if there would be a connection or a way to collaborate with that particular department. So, so that was year one. And correct me if I'm wrong, I know you've been there almost 25 years. I believe it was about 16 years prior, 16 years you were there prior to becoming CEO. And, you know, there's a lot of leaders in the middle of organizations or maybe their leadership role, and maybe they see, hey, one day I would like to be in that senior role. Did you have that? Did you have to be really, really patient? Were there times you won the role, but it wasn't able to, and you just stuck around? Because we live in a culture where people just don't stay places long. You know, if you look at the average resume, most people are skipping jobs every two or three years. And I see a lot of leaders not willing to wait and actually bloom where they're planted. Can you just walk us through that journey and the waiting? Was that frustrating for you? Was it not? And do you have any advice for leaders who, who get frustrated that they're not going, getting promoted fast enough? Well, I've been fortunate in my time uh, at the food bank that I've had a number of promotions over the years. So I've not felt stagnant or locked into one position or even one level within the organization. And every time I have been promoted, it's brought a new set of challenges, greater responsibility that's allowed me to continue to, to stretch and learn and, and take on more. And it's really I've fed my, my passion for the work and especially uh, fed my passion for leadership and, and, and I've learned so much at each level I've been in with the food bank. So I've, I've never felt stuck or frustrated in, in terms of not advancing. Um, I will say I was the COO for 10 years. Towards the end of that 10 year period, I, 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 I knew I was ready to become a CEO. And I was also very cognizant of the fact that the CEO and the COO role are so vastly different. Hmm. But in reporting to the CEO, I had insight into the workings of what it would take to be a CEO. So I will say those last few years as the COO, I, I was anxious and, and eager to take on the role of the CEO at the food bank. Yeah. So, so what I heard you say is, Basically, if you're doing something you love, you should, you should be so immersed in the work that you don't really think about career progression. And if you have natural leadership gifting, that should emerge. And if you're in a healthy culture, there should be opportunities, maybe not overnight, but over time, your leadership will be recognized and you'll be given the opportunity to lead. And if you learn at the right level what you're supposed to learn, you'll be ready for the next position. Well, and I think because I'm at a food bank and we're part of the Feeding America network, which is a, a very much of a learning network and sharing mm. network, cooperative and collaborative network, I had opportunities to serve at the national level, uh, uh, serving on different committees and getting involved at the uh, national level for Feeding America. And so even though I was at the COO level, there were still opportunities to gain other leadership experience. And also I served on other boards of directors of, of, of nonprofits. And that also then allowed me uh, to experience leadership as a, as a board member. And so I encourage people, you, you know, there are many organizations that, that you may not be able to advance. And, and I, I, I know that people uh, sometimes get frustrated and they feel as though they need to change jobs. And sometimes that's just frankly the right decision. Go ahead and, and change jobs because you want to progress in your career. If, 
if that's something you're interested in, if you're interested in leadership, if you're interested in taking on more responsibility, there are times you just need to, to, to find another organization to work for. But if you are kind of locked into your organization, there may be other avenues for you to gain additional leadership experience. Yeah. And you mentioned when you were CEO, you, you know, you kind of got a front row seat of what it takes to be a CEO and you've been now one for, I think, eight or nine years. What, what does it take? What do you wish people knew about being a CEO? You know, everyone wants the corner office. They want the, they want the position, but then you sit in it and you have all the weight of the, you know, what does it actually take to be and sit in that seat? Yeah. Well, first and foremost, it's such an honor to lead an organization. I mean, it's you, you, you feel that I'm kind of tingling now, just even, oh. even mentioning that to you, Doug, it, it really, I really am. It's uh, an electricity going through me right now. Um, thinking about that, because it is such an honor to do that. I mean, it's people have entrusted you with leading an organization and um, there's, there's no other feeling like that. It's, it's a wonderful feeling. At the same time, <laughs> it, it is a lonely position. Yeah. You know, there are very few people you can confide in. You can't confide in the people who report to you or the staff. You can confide in other leaders. People don't realize how hard it is. You know, I got a lot of great advice and I had a lot of great conversations when I first became a, a CEO. And I remember at a Feeding America conference talking to someone I so respect, the CEO of another food bank, and he and I talked for two hours, and, and I was so grateful to him. I was a new CEO. He was experienced. I mean, we stayed up late just talking, and, and he said, no one knows how hard this is. Your wow. staff doesn't know. Your board has no idea. It is an extremely hard job in terms of what, what's expected of you, in terms of leading the organization. Um, it isn't just the fundraising. Fundraising is, um, you know, well, I think fundraising is a privilege. I love talking about the food bank and raising money. I know you do too, yeah, Doug. Absolutely. You love raising money. But it's, it's the decisions. It's the weight of the decisions, you know, whether it's personnel or, or a building project, whatever it is. But it's all solars. And, and for food bankers in a um, city of our size of Pittsburgh, it's also a fairly public position. So even when I'm out at a baseball game or, or a movie or at a, a concert, music concert, I'll run into people who recognize me and, and always talking, you know, food banking. So oh, and hey, and to you probably won't say this, but you were the Pittsburgher of the year last or this year, right? That's so. right. Super. So now everyone knows you. Yeah. Which is That's awesome. Right. <laughs> um, you mentioned, you know, it's, it's an honor and a privilege. It's also lonely. It's also very, very difficult, very hard. I'm just curious, you as a leader, how do you actually deal with the weight? You know, how do you relieve stress? How do you deal with the pain of the decisions that you've made that impact people sometimes in a negative way? What do you do personally to recover from that? Well, I have to say, I've been fortunate that I wear my food bank hat when I wear, make any decision. And that's what I call it. I, I don't know. I just came up with that phrase. It's anytime I'm making a decision about the food bank, I'm wearing my food bank hat. So I'm always making decisions that are in the best interest of the food bank. And even those decisions that are hard to make, that might be a personnel decision that is a, a, a difficult decision to make. Well, if I know how challenging and difficult it may be for the person I'm speaking with the, the, on the personnel issue, I always know that I'm doing right by the food bank. Mm -hmm. I'm making every decision is made in the best interest of the food bank. It's never personal. It's never about me. It's, 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 it's frankly always about what's in the best interest of the food bank. And that served me well. I mean, that every decision then I can sleep at night. I know um, to the best of my ability, I've made a good decision for the food bank based on the information I had at the time. So good. Uh, this is really broad, but any other leadership lessons that come to mind that, that you would say, hey, my 25 years, if I could go to the bank on this lesson, it'd be this about leadership. Well, the other piece in terms of being a new CEO, um, the other piece of uh, advice I, I had was to really focus on 
prioritization and delegation because you have so much coming at you. And, you know, again, every level, it's a, it's a new challenge. There's more responsibility. And you think, oh, I can handle it because I went from supervisor to manager to program officer to COO. And CEO is just, it's the next rung up. But it's not just one rung up. It's like 10 rungs up, I'll be honest. <laughs> wow. I mean, I thought I knew what it would be like. I had no idea. There's so much coming at you. So many, everybody wants your time. And if you are not smart about time management, about if you're not good at delegating, if you're not good at prioritizing, you can just sink. You know, it's like swim or sink. And you would just flounder um, because there's just, it would be so overwhelming. Uh, you have, and also, of course, having good people. You know, I have an excellent executive team and uh, a great board of directors. And um, that's, that's really, I've benefited from, from both of those uh, over the years. Yeah, and do you have a, a team around you or maybe an, an admin that helps you say no and helps you prioritize? Or is that just a skill you gained over time to learn what to say yes to and what to say no to? Yes. Well, you know, it has not, that has been one weakness that I've had is I I have a hard time saying no. And, you know, when you wear that CEO hat, you're always looking for opportunities and and always, you know, want to explore what what could be possible, right? What's possible. So definitely uh, my executive team members help me in that regard. And my executive assistant helps tremendously in that regard. Um, I have definitely gotten better over the years. Uh, more judicious about my time, both with internal meetings and external. You know, one of the challenges of becoming a CEO uh, as the internal person who had been the COO is staff still approach you and and pull you into programming meetings. And that's not how I should be spending my time. So I learned that early on as well, is to be really thoughtful about what meetings should I be in? But more importantly, you know, what meetings do I not need to be in? And I, you know, we have, again, terrific staff and I trust them and they are, are hardworking, passionate, resilient and, and committed to the mission and, and they make great decisions. So that's an easy one for me. Yeah, just out of curiosity, you know, you brought up that example of being in program meetings early. It was, is that just a discussion with, you know, your program team and just saying, Hey, you know, unfortunately, this isn't the best use of my time. You guys need to figure this out. Worst case, come to me. But what was that conversation like? Yeah, it was two way because actually, I knew I, I, there were meetings I didn't need to be in. But actually, even our, our chief program officer will be the first one to say, Lisa, you don't need to be in this meeting. I think the challenge is when it's a new partner. Um, there are often times that I want to be in the first meeting or the initial meeting and then do a handoff to the program folks. Because yeah. for me, so much of the work is about relationships. But even then, you don't always have to be in every first meeting either. So it's not always, it doesn't have to be me every time. And, and the program staff, actually, I think they might prefer it not to <laughs> be me. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, so I, I was surprised to hear your fundraising response. So, you know, you started off in programs, although it sounds like part of your programs was in the development team. Uh, and then you were in an operating role and you don't often hear people in operations or programs ever say that I enjoy fundraising. Was a, the fundraising had something you just put on as CEO? Were you involved with it before? And of course, I have to ask you, you know, what have you learned about fundraising in your time? Yes, so fundraising was brand new to me as a CEO. I really did not get involved in fundraising at all, as even as the COO. It took a little while, but really, I mean, I would say after the first year, maybe it was the first year I was I was timid in my approach. And, you know, I always hear about, oh, no one likes to fundraise, you know, no one likes to ask for money and it's hard to ask for money. Well, Doug, I don't tell you, it's not about asking for money. It's about developing the relationships. It's yeah. about talking what I'm passionate about, which is talking about the food bank and, and the money will come from that. And so that's what I love. Uh, you know, we're, we've opened back up. I've had some uh, meetings with some major donors again, uh, you know, this in this time of COVID and, um, you know, that's been great because I missed that, you know, over the last year, year and a half is is speaking one-on-one with, with, with some of our donors and supporters. And that piece comes easily to me. And so I'm not intimidated. And, and to me, it's, 
uh, we're providing this opportunity for somebody to also make a difference in people's lives. So it's a two-way street uh, when, when you're speaking with, with the donor. Yeah. And you, you kind of answered, well, this may have been one answer, but I am curious, you know, if you could go back and, and talk to yourself when you started the CEO role, what would this Lisa today tell that Lisa then? Oh my gosh. I would say um, to be more patient. You know, one of the great pieces of advice I got was from a long time Feeding America CEO who mentored me my first year when I called, I called up uh, the COO of Feeding America after my first six months on the, on the job as the CEO. And I called him and I said, I've got so much coming at me. I'm, I'm doing what I can to delegate and prioritize, but it's still so much. Is there anyone who you could recommend that I talk to on a regular basis who can mentor me and, and who, who's just doing an exceptional job as the CEO? And he connected me with uh, Jan Pruitt, who at the time was the CEO of the North Texas Food Bank in Dallas. And the piece of advice that sticks with me is she said to me, Lisa, it's a marathon, not a sprint. Um, Cause she saw my schedule. She saw what I, she heard, you know, I went and visited her and saw her operation and, and sat in on her executive team meetings. And, and she was just so generous with her time, but that has, is forever sticking with me that this is a marathon, not a sprint. And while I have a sense of urgency about ending hunger, um, definitely um, it, it is in terms of the work I'm in, I'm in this for the long haul. Uh, the work is going to continue, but you have to pace yourself as a leader. And, and that's what I would, I would tell myself. I just wanted everything to happen yesterday. And you know, change doesn't happen that quickly. And so that's, that's the biggest piece of advice I would give myself if I was talking to a younger me. Yeah, that sparked another question I'd, I'd be curious about. You talked about executive meetings. What have you learned about meetings? <laughs> and I am, I am curious, you know, how do you run your executive team meetings? Do you guys meet weekly? What do those meetings look like? Yeah, they've changed over the years. And I was involved when I was on a manager at the food bank. I was in, uh, you know, management. You know, we didn't have executives at the time, but I was in management meetings at the time. I think we're weekly at that time. Uh, what we've settled into, we have a... Um, Every other week, uh, we have a long, a two and a half hour meeting that is more strategic discussions. And on those in-between weeks, we have a uh, 45 minute hot topic meeting uh, that we just go around and anybody who has a hot topic, uh, just to do some information sharing, we do that. I know, um, and it's not just the food bank, people are feeling um, overextended when it comes to meetings. Uh, we all feel like, uh, there's, there's a lot of meetings in our lives, and now we have a lot of Zoom calls that can be uh, draining after a while. But you know that is also how the work gets done, and it's a way that you can discuss strategies and make decisions. Uh, so we have those at the executive team. And then we have a senior leaders that's made up of executives and directors, and we meet monthly. And actually, we just changed our agenda. It used to be we would pack, they were an hour and a half long meetings. And we had so many agenda items that each agenda item was only five minutes or 10 minutes at the most. And it was basically information sharing. And we opened it up to the directors and found out, no surprise, you know, we could put all that information in an email message and they didn't think it was the most productive use of their time. So mm -hmm. I, I really um, value their input. I mean, we asked so I was asking that question of them. And just the other day, we had our first new, newly structured uh, senior leaders meeting where we limited it to um, four agenda items over two hours. Mm -hmm. And we've agreed moving forward, we would only have three or four agenda items uh, for each meeting and we could have deeper discussions. And we had, we had some great conversation uh, the other day at, at the senior leaders uh, meeting. Wow. I want to dive into the lightning round, which I know you're super excited about, but anything else you want to share about your journey or leadership before we dive into that? I think, I think you, you covered most of it. All right. I think we'll cover more during the lightning round. Let's go. First question of the lightning round is what is the best advice you ever received and who gave it to you? 
Well, I already talked about some of the advice, but I was saving one for the lightning round in case you would ask this question, Doug. Jim McDonald, uh, formerly with uh, BNY Mellon, gave me great advice early on when I became the CEO, which was don't spill all your candy in the lobby. And he saw when he took me out to introduce me to program officers at local foundations, and they would ask me one question, I would just tell them everything the food bank was doing. <laughs> I've done that. Yep. So don't spill all your candy in the lobby. Uh, Jim, that'll oh, forever stick with me. That's good stuff. Uh, if you could put a quote on a billboard for everyone to read, what would it say? Breathe deeply and often. <laughs> What's the best purchase you've made in the last year for $100 or less? You know, I don't even, I have not purchased a whole lot in the last year. So it's probably an app, you know, that I purchased for a couple dollars. Um, I have some really good apps and, and that's definitely, I think, the biggest splurge I've had in the last year. Okay. Are you a podcast listener? Well, I love, I love your podcast and I love our podcast. The Food Bank has the food podcast. So that's what I, I listen to. There are a few others that I listen to also that are either sports related or leadership related. Awesome. What's your greatest challenge right now as a leader? Transforming the organization, looking ahead, um, mm -hmm. see what food banking will look like in 10 years and how we can transform what we're doing to have an even greater impact. Do you have a favorite failure that led to ultimately led to a success or a, a significant lesson that changed everything for you? When I applied for the CEO position and did not get it the first time, and I decided to stay at the organization and do the best and do what I could to ensure the new CEO would be successful. And that ended up, you know, in the long run, working out well for me. Wow. Uh, I may have missed that if you mentioned that earlier. Was there a reason you didn't get it? I, I believe that the board did not, they did not see the CEO potential in me. Um, they saw me as the COO hmm. and I really did not take that opportunity. I wish I would have to present myself more in a leadership capacity uh, with the board of directors. Do you think you would have been ready now that you, you do know what it's like to sit in the seat or did you need some more development? I did. It was only, there was a year um, the CEO at the time decided to move back to, um, he had come here from, from another state and he decided to, to go back to where his family was. So it was only a year, but I did, you know, I learned a lot in that year and uh, definitely felt ready to become the CEO at the time. It's been clear throughout the podcast that, that you're a learner and that you seek out mentors and you seek out learning lunches. Uh, you get to spend time with a lot of influential people. And I'm just curious, you know, when you meet with a leader for the first time, is there a go-to question or two that you always ask no matter what? I, I typically will ask people what keeps them up at night. And then I want to hear about their greatest success. So I'll turn those on you. What keeps you up at night? <laughs> Uh, what keeps me up at night is that isolated senior in Somerset County who doesn't have hmm. family around and may not have enough food or the kids who go to bed hungry. Um, I want to ensure that everyone has consistent access to nutritious food. So, you know, it keeps me up at night when I know that there are people out there who don't have enough to eat. Hmm. And the other question was, what's your greatest success? Is that correct? Yeah. I, I would say, you know, how we've so far, so far, and I, I, I believe I'll have even, even greater success moving forward, but really proud of how, uh, how we've uh, responded to the pandemic and how we practically overnight had to determine new ways and develop new ways of safely providing food to people. Um, and we had to step up in terms of the the significant increase in demand. Yeah, it was incredible to watch that. Well, it's still going on, obviously, but it was incredible to watch that journey. And I know that's one of the reasons you were Pittsburgher of the Year. And really, it's a reflection of your organization. And so thank you for all the good you do. And you're a great partner to Light of Life. Uh, we really appreciate everything you, you do to partner with us as well. Um, what This is always a fun one. What is your biggest leadership pet peeve? Uh, micromanaging. Leaders who mm. micromanage. Also, leaders who yell, 
I'm not a yeller, <laughs> I'm not a micromanager. So when I, when I hear about that or I even see it in action, which I don't see it in action all that, all that, all that much, but it rubs me the wrong way. Do you have any habits or I like to put unusual habits that, that make you productive or successful? Not unusual. I mean, I do, I do make lists to make sure I'm a big believer in checklists and making sure I'm, I'm completing things. But I, I do take time at the end of the day to meditate uh, mm -hmm. every day. And I think that's, that's helped me. It help, helps me de-stress, but also helps center me, you know, at least once a day. Um, if you have a bucket list, I'm, I always like asking, you know, are there one or two things you've crossed off your bucket list that you think everyone should experience at some point in their lifetime? Becoming a CEO. <laughs> that actually wasn't because I, I said I was not, uh, I, I wasn't prone to that. It wasn't what I was thinking when I joined the nonprofit. I'm making my way through um, all the baseball stadiums. I know oh. that's on, you know, many people have that on their bucket list. I've also gone to a number of uh, state capitals. Um, so I'm not all the way through all 50 states, but I've gone to a number of state capitals as well. And I have some travel, you know, there's some places I would love to go. I haven't been to Hawaii or, or Greece or Antarctica. So there's some places I'd love to go. Yeah. So in your opinion, is PNC still the best park in America to watch a baseball game at? It is, although I, I heard that the new ballpark in Arlington in Texas is good with the Rangers, and I hear great things about uh, where the San Francisco Giants play. So those are two ballparks I have not been to yet. Okay. Uh, if you could go back and give your 20-year-old self-advice, what would you tell her? I would say it's a marathon, not a sprint. Hmm. I would also say be more forgiving of yourself. I think when we're younger, we're really hard on ourselves. And one of the probably better aspects of aging, if there are any, is that you uh, know yourself better, more comfortable with yourself. So, um, you know, that's where the patience comes in and kind of be more forgiving of yourself. And on the other end of your journey, when you're at the end of your life, what do you ultimately want to be remembered for? What do you want your legacy to be? that I've made a difference in people's lives. I mean, that's really, I mean, I just knew from my parents, uh, my father in particular, basically instilled in me, you know, but for the grace of God, go I, you mm -hmm. know, I could have just been as easily born into another family, another economic, you know, situation and, and be food insecure and, and need, need food assistance. And, you know, I really, what got me, uh, interested in in the food bank in particular was the ability to make a difference in people's lives and and ensure that people have a brighter future and can thrive and 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 reach all of their goals and and that's really you know what what i hope i can do and what i hope our organization can do and anything else you want to leave leaders with today as we close you know it's a journey <laughs> Uh, I think, as we all know, those of us who are leaders, it's a journey. There's a lot of um, left turns. I know I've had a lot of left turns and different paths that I didn't it didn't um, expect in my leadership journey, but it's all been valuable. Um, I've taken risks and and you know, and I've had failures and I've had success, and I learn probably more from my failures than I do my success. But it's it's, it's, it's all been helped form me as a leader. And, and I take all of that and I hold all of that as I go through this leadership journey. And, and so I hope, I hope you all do. And I hope, I hope those of you who are leaders who are listening to this um, and you can be a leader at any level of, of an organization, uh, you know, I hope you, I hope you lead with your authentic self and, and, and you are asking questions and you're collaborative and you're bringing people together that, you know, we can have that collective impact. It really, you know, when you, when you do that and, and you have a great team with you, you, you can really accomplish so much. Well, Lisa, thank you so much for saying yes to this conversation. It was wonderful. I learned a lot. I know everyone listening to this well as well. And thank you for giving your life away for others. It's made a significant difference. And thank you for sharing your journey with us today. 
Oh, you're welcome, Doug. Thank you for having me on. And it's just an honor to do this work. Thank you so much. Well, hey, Leader, thank you so much for listening to my conversation with Lisa Scales. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. And you can find ways to connect with her and links to everything that we discussed in the show notes at l3leadership.org forward slash 295. And Leader, if you want to 10x your growth this year, then I really want to challenge you to either launch or join an L3 Leadership Mastermind Group. Mastermind Groups have been the greatest source of growth in my life over the last six years, and they're simply groups of six to 12 leaders that meet together for at least one year in order to help each other grow, achieve their goals, and to do life together. So if you're interested in learning more, go to l3leadership.org forward slash masterminds. And as always, I like to end every episode with a quote, and I'll quote Joe Brooks today. He said this, he said, leadership isn't about the crowd you draw but rather the number of people that you help. Well, Leader, I hope you enjoy this episode. Know that Laura and I love you so much. We believe in you and keep leading. Don't quit. The world needs you to lead. Have a great day and we'll talk to you next episode.